Austin, will you start off by giving us a quick overview of the state of transportation in Texas and how our funding challenges develop? We need money. And I'm here talking to well, I have I have a lot of bosses in the room today. I have my dad down here and I have Senator L type. It's like going to your parents asking for money. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. And then sometimes if you do get it, they're gonna tell you how to use it and how to spend it. This is a little where we find ourselves right now with Texas transportation. If you go back over 40 years, if you look at our population, it's increased by over 125%. Our road use has picked up over 200%, but the actual amount of new roads that we've put in place, new capacity is what I want to call it, made an increase barely 10%. So you look at the increased congestion and you look at what we actually have, it's like using a, I was in a, a, a Walmart the other day buying a hunting license, and the guy said that you have to forgive me because it's, it's uh, coming over 44 May. It's old dial-up system that you're trying to get the hunting license. Well, we like it now in our, our uh, uh, look at our uh, technology that we use with our iPhones. We want it right now. When we want to get in our vehicle up to Dallas, go across town, we want to be able to get there quickly, safely, and rapidly without a lot of traffic. Using that same technology analogy to look at the condition where we are right now, we're using dial-up systems. And we, with the, over a thousand Texans moving here, with, and they're having babies, by the way. And you, you turn around, you look at the, tra the congestion that we have. There's simply not enough money to one maintain a safe system, and then add new capacity quick enough, and then begin looking at the new impacts that we have, like the energy sector, uh, looking at our ports, and our airports, and other multimodal systems. Senator Elton. From your perspective with the legislature, how have you guys been dealing with this, this problem? Well, the situation at TxDOT is a disaster. It has been for the last 10 years. We used to be the envy of the country because we were on a pay to go basis. We had the revenue to build our roads and pay cash. The last 10 years, you know what? We have doubled the state's debt. I want you to think about this. 10 years ago, we had $17 billion with a B dollars in state debt. Today, we have 42 billion dollars in state debt. The majority of that new debt is funding roads in the state of Texas. Why? Because politicians don't have the courage to raise taxes. I will argue until hell freezes over that we should have raised taxes 10 years ago, put in place a pay-as-you-go system for this state, pay for our roads with cash, and not have the debt we have today. The only way we're going to get out of this is today we need 4 billion at a minimum, maybe 5 billion, just to maintain the current congestion level. That's not to ease congestion in the state, that's just to maintain it. Four to five billion, right now, we're short every single year. Thank goodness for Senator Nichols working on Prop 1, this will help some, but it's only gonna help about 25% of new money that it will provide for TxDOT. It is a step in the right direction, and I hope we can earn the voters' support to pass this. It does not solve the problem we will still be short funding in the state for Texas Department of Transportation by three or four billion dollars. What do we have to do? Oh my gosh, yes. We gotta raise taxes. I've been preaching we should raise the gas tax a minimum of a dime and index it to inflation. If you don't like the gas tax, let's do sales tax. It needs to be a consumption tax. I'm not married to anyone, but we have to get off this fact that it's not gonna take new money. It's not gonna fall out of the sky. So we have to have the courage to fix the problem. And you know what? Many people in this area remember Tyler's half cent sales tax. We raised the sales tax, half a cent. You know what? Tyler had zero obligation bond debt. We have a 19 cent property tax rate. We only pay cash for improvements. The state of Texas could do the same thing if we had the political courage to tell the voters the truth. Just to add Yeah, to add to Senator mentioned the revenue that's coming in. If you look at where we are from a revenue standpoint, we're basically relying on the same revenue that we relied on 20 years ago. So the, the state gas tax, the federal gas tax were last raised in 91 and 93 respectively. They're they're both, you know, at the same level. They're not a percentage. So as gas has gone up, they were gas was about a dollar at the time that, that it was last raised. Think about where gas is today and the percentage of tax that we were paying then compared to what we're paying today 
for gas tax. Vehicle registration fee is one of the other main funding sources for, for transportation in the state. Same thing, that rate hasn't been changed since the early 1990s. So again, over the last two decades, the, the funding mechanisms for transportation have remained pretty much the same while our needs have grown dramatically. And then when you look at what, what's happened from a construction standpoint, the cost of construction has just about doubled over that same time period. So you're looking at a revenue source that's remained pretty much static. The cost of doing what you need to do from a transportation has doubled, and you're starting to see why we're in the problem that we're in. Um, and really, if you look at it, we're paying less today for transportation than we were 20 years ago because you're getting better vehicle uh, miles per gallon than you used to. So when you're driving, you, you go drive 200 miles, the amount of gas tax you're paying for that 200 miles because you're using less gallons is less than what it was 20 years ago. So at the end of the day, we're actually all paying less for our roads, for our transportation, than what we were paying 20 years ago, especially when you take into account things like inflation and, and everything else. So that's why that's why when Commissioner Austin read off those stats about new capacity versus the growth, I and mean, that's why we're in that problem we're in. We haven't had the funding to build that new capacity we need to match that growth. I'd like to come back in and kind of add to what you're talking about, the inflation factor. When that uh, gas tax was put in place uh, years ago, that was a pay-as-you-go system. And we had enough cash uh, to pay as we went and add new capacity and maintain a good, safe, reliable system. If you look at the purchasing power of that 18 cents, uh, 20 cents that we have right now, it's about six, six and a half, seven cents. And think about that. What was in real time at 20 cents that you had 20 cents worth of purchasing power, again, it's only worth about seven cents right now. So it has been deflated substantially. Then you start adding in congestion, air quality issues. East Texas is not immune from air quality issues. We're going to have to find ways to add capacity and move traffic because we are close to non-attainment, Tyler Longview. We've got to be careful of that. Um, if you look at construction cost index, as Scott was mentioning, if you take a $500 million project that we uh, would have done in 2010, just barely three years ago, today, with construction costs uh, going up, and continuing to go up, that would cost us about $625 million uh, plus. If you project that same 10 and do it five years from now, it's going to look at, it, we're going to be close to over $800 million. So you look at just the cost to do one road. Now, I want to put some things in perspective as we're looking at the Prop 1. The Senator said we're going to be solved by 25%. As every day goes by, that number is dropping rapidly. We're working, many of y'all travel to Houston, and you know, we have traffic problems here. We have a lot of, Houston, one of the fastest growing cities, with port, intermodal, a lot of, a lot of challenges. If we were to look at the $1.7 billion, based on recent estimates from the LDB, that this proposition might, if, if y'all pass this, I hope you do, we'll get a deposit in instead of November, and we're looking at ways to spend that right now. I'll come back and talk about it. But to put it in perspective, we issued bonds, revenue, total revenue bonds, uh, on the Grand Parkway for a, just a small piece of it. That was $2 billion. So if you look at the needs, talking about one part of one roadway in one city, there's, and then you start looking at every place else, Dallas, you, know, you look at 35, that's the uh, biggest parking lot we have in the state. We can't add capacity fast enough. 31, Interstate 20. And by the way, Judge Stout, I know is not here. I want to thank him for chairing our Interstate uh, 20 Advisory Committee, looking at improvements there. You start looking at other roadways that we have, and you start saying, okay, what's going to be my share of that $1.7 million? Senator hit it right on. It's not nearly enough. And what we need to identify, and we're, they're challenged, uh, but we can only spend what they authorize consistent and reliable funding sources. I want to come back and say consistent and reliable funding sources. Um, the legislature, prior to the senator getting there, took part of the gas tax because it was revenue coming in and said we're going to divert part of it to DPS, Attorney General's office. We're going to divert part of it to uh, education. I'm not here to say education doesn't need it, but I, 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 I agree with what uh, Speaker Strauss has said, truth in taxation. If it's a gas tax, it ought to go to, uh, to, to transportation. And I think, you know, to build on on the, the needs, we've mentioned a four to $5 billion figure. That's not a static number. 
every every year that doesn't get addressed. The expense goes up, um, and, and one of the big new expenses that we just didn't have as a state before is what's happening with energy production in the state. The damage that's occurring to farm to market roads across the state, just that alone is estimated to be north of a billion dollars a year. And th these are roads that just weren't designed for that type of activity, that weight of truck, that much traffic on the roads. And so that's a new challenge that the state has. It's, it's not something that was predicted. We hadn't planned to have that much activity taking place on, on this farm to market system, on the county road system. And so that's another area that we're having to address. It's adding to that dollar figure of us falling behind from a transportation standpoint. And every year that we don't address it, every year that the legislature doesn't make those decisions to put more money into transportation, that number is only going to grow. It's going to get bigger as we don't address it because the costs continue to rise. And every year you don't address it, you still have that $5 billion from that year that you didn't address the problem. Well, Senator Eltoff, what, what can we Solve this problem. Right. Uh, actually, we need to pass Prop 1. That's a no brainer. And I hope the voters will pass it just because we talked about it. It's a step in the right direction. It might solve 20, 25% of the problem. But the biggest issue is the legislature has to find a consistent, long term revenue source for transportation in the state of Texas. The problem is this you're going to go into session, you already hear, oh, we have a surplus. So why would you want to raise taxes? Well, really, when you look at the sur surplus, it's a snapshot of a two-year period. Yes, our revenues are up from this two-year period. Yes, we spent less than we said we were going to, so we have a surplus. But when we get there, we already know TRS care needs a billion dollars to shore it up. The Medicaid uh, <coughs> settlement for our supplemental will probably be one or two billion dollars. The money goes fast. And the problem is, yeah, you might piece together if you get this passed, might say the legislation the easy way out is to say all right we're going to give two billion on top of that out of the current revenue stream this session but it's not a consistent long-term revenue source you've got to have, give TxDOT the money they need that's always dedicated and there for future years these projects take five to ten years out to plan they've got to do right away they got they got about the engineering if we don't have a consistent revenue source long term, the congestion in the state is only going to get worse. Everybody, everybody likes to run around the state bragging about how we're the number one place in the country to do business. We've created more jobs than anyone else. That is wonderful. But if we don't have water and roads for the future, it's not going to continue. We have to invest in the future of this state, and it's going to require money. And when I go talk to groups, I've yet to have a group that tells me, but it shouldn't have raised taxes versus the debt we've incurred. We've maxed out the credit card. We can't do the cheap, easy, politically cowardly thing anymore and sell bonds. It's over with. So if you think about this, the last 10 years, we've put $30 billion in more debt in this state. Now everybody says, Eltaf, you don't need to raise taxes. Just get it through spending cuts. So let's do this. Let's look at the last 10 years and take that $30 billion out that we spent the last 10 years. Now let's take back the roads we built, and let's take back the higher education buildings we built, whatever that 30 billion went for. And you tell me we could have lived without those roads and without those buildings, and I'll be fine not to raise taxes, but we spent 30 billion in the last 10 years with bond debt, and it needed to be spent, and you're gonna have to continue to spend that type of money going forward. Now where's the money gonna come from? And we did the most ridiculous thing we could have ever done with toll roads. Toll roads should be a piece of this puzzle, but not owned by the private sector. That's insanity. I'm in commercial real estate. When I have a hard corner, I don't sell it. I ground lease it to Walgreens or Chewy's. That's what the state should have owned those toll roads. So here's what happens when you're through with the toll, when you're through with the debt. Either get rid of the toll, or that toll becomes revenue for the future uh, roads in rural Texas that can't toll stuff. We didn't do that because that would have been big government. What we did is we let the private sector take those captive audiences and build those toll roads. And what's involved in those tolls? Their profit. I don't blame them. Their private sector. They did it to make money. So go drive on a toll. Go drive on the, the George Bush presidential toll in Dallas and see how much your toll is. You might end up paying 20 or 30 bucks if you go far enough. It's a private, it's owned by the private sector. It's insanity. We gave away the farm. All in the name of less government. That's what's happened in this state. 
you know what? It takes a little political courage. We should have owned those toll roads. We should have bonded them, and we should have used that money after they're paid off to cut the toll or put it back into tech stock. Only way you're going to save this uh, state's transportation needs is with additional revenue, new revenue, a tax. Some form of a new tax is going to have to, you're going to have to have it. And at some point when the crisis hits, maybe we'll have political courage to fix it. And I want to share something with you. You brought up toll roads. And one thing, you know, you look at some of the ones that are happening in Austin, and uh, maybe your Q&A, we can discuss and separate what's happening here in East Texas with the net RMA, toll 49 compared to the section of well, five and six that is least. Jeff's nervous, I'm talking about his toll road. <laughs> 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 I would say that would not have, early on, to find a way to really bring congestion uh, to pay for itself uh, with what we did around East Texas, hopefully it'll be able to be over here in Longview. This has been a great solution. Linda Thomas, the chair of RMA, thank you for, I know you've got two other board members here, Dave Spurrier and Keith Honey, thank you all for what you do. And, and uh, Tim, uh, there's not an easy solution, but Prop 1, if passed, will not be used, I wanna make sure this is clear, none of this money will be used for any type of toll road planning, construction, or anything. This is one step getting us back closer to pay as, pay as you go. And as, we, as the senator was talking about fees, you know, we look at things. My sister lives in Colorado. I've talked to her recently about her registration fee. I think we pay $55, $60, you know, state level, then you're, you put it up to some for the county. I mean, I think I paid for my Tahoe $65 last, uh, it's an old Tahoe. She pays $350, almost $400 for her registration. I love participating, and I love saying we have the lowest tax rate, we have the lowest this, that, and the other, the lowest fees. But when you start adding congestion in here, <coughs> volume that are using this, uh, it, it complicates the matter because there's not enough revenue. And I want to hear that, you know, Keith talking about power. If I'm a subscriber uh, with, with Swiftco, I pay for the power I use. And one thing here, you know, with the gas tax, in theory, you know, with the, what we have right now, you pay for the miles driven. Well, that's not necessarily true. The last vehicles that we all purchased are a little more efficient. And philosophically, I think we can say that gas tax that's generated per gallon that's pumped. Again, the gas tax is a set price regardless of the price of gas. It's going further. Your vehicle, you're getting more miles per gallon, which means in theory, if you're driving this, uh, uh, 1,000 miles a month, uh, today, and you drove a thousand miles a month six or seven years ago, the state would actually receive more money six or seven years ago because you were pumping and filling up more regularly. And so I'm showing the impact philosophically. We're going to hit a declining trend as the vehicles become more fuel efficient. The gas tax revenue will be slower and slower coming in. Uh, not to divert, but this is part of what's happening with the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, nationally, uh, that's our next big bucket of money because TxDOT, our legislative, uh, our budget that we're sending into the state is a little about, is about 23 billion for the next two years. We have to project out two years. About a third of that is state revenue. Another third of that is federal revenue. The other third are from uh, user fees and things like uh, the other fees that we have coming back in. So we have to address all three. What could have happened and I'm going to talk about borrowing. I'm going to come back just a second. <coughs> borrowing is not always a bad thing because many of our businesses use it, but there's a right time and place. Had the Federal Highway Trust Fund shut down and they didn't do a short-term fix for six months, it was we were notified by the U.S. Department of Transportation that would have taken our reimbursements from $300 million per month down to about $175 million. That's a $125 million cut. If that, and that would have lasted about six months. If we went along with those additional six months without funding, the legislature has given us the ability to borrow short term to fund <coughs> needs that we may have. We'll say, okay, a lot of your businesses have backup lines of credit. We start comparing this with other states. Other states do not all have that ability to even come back and borrow and do things if we need to. Again, it's there if we need it. The legislature has looked at it and given us those tools, and we're very appreciative. I, I started off talking about the vehicle registration fee. There are a lot of other things that we have the ability to look at and do. 
But it's coming back to what Senator Eltoff has made the comment I've been privately many, many times. Let us have the discussion. And I think as we look at different ways to do things, uh, uh, so Scott, I know you studied the uh, motor vehicle sales tax. That's one thing next session that may be looked at that could have a positive impact. <coughs> yeah, the, the motor vehicle sales tax today, it, it's all goes to general revenue. So we still create some of the issues that the Senator talked about. You gotta figure out a way to fund whatever you're gonna fund. But right now it goes to general revenue. So it, it looks like it's something Senator Nichols has talked about a lot. It, it's a logical thing that we would dedicate a portion of our motor vehicle sales tax to transportation. Takes takes an existing revenue source that really is exactly centered around what it would be used for, which is transportation. If you have a vehicle, you're going to be driving on the roads. It's it's pegged to inflation because it's a percentage right now. It's pegged to, or to population growth because as we have more vehicles on the road, we're going to see that tax rate go up. So. I think it's something that, that will be discussed, but, but frankly, if we don't pass Proposition 1, I don't think we're going to be able to have any of these conversations next session because it's going to be really hard for anyone to go to the senator and say, hey, I need you to invest more in transportation, or, or the representative, and they're going to say, well, my citizens didn't even care enough about transportation to pass something that was going to cost them zero dollars. And that's what's important about Proposition 1. This is no new taxes on you, no new fees on you, no new debt on the citizens of Texas, which is why it's so important that we pass it. It's taking an existing revenue source that currently goes into the rainy day fund, and it's dedicating a portion of that into the state highway fund. And, and our goal is to make sure that we pass this by a big enough margin that we can go into the next legislative session and go to the representative and go to the senator and say, okay, Texans care about transportation. We have got to start investing more in our infrastructure. You've seen how they voted this last November. Now let's start addressing this issue. And that's why this is so important. This proposition, you know, it, it, it took a while for us to get there in the last legislature. But once we got there, it really does a great job of, of addressing some of the needs we have, especially with the energy and gas production that's happening in the state right now. And it does a couple other things that, that I think are important. One, TxDOT has to use formulas to distribute this money, and I know the commissioner will talk about the process that they're going through right now to do that. And one of the other things that, that it does is puts a little bit of accountability on the TxDOT. They've done a great job and, and are continuing to do a great job of finding efficiencies, of being a better government agency, that doing as much as they can with the money that they're given. And, and one of the things the legislature said was, if we're going to give you these additional funds, we're going to ask you to be more efficient with what you have. So go find $100 million in administrative savings that will then go to pay down that debt that the department has incurred over the last decade through, through the legislature and through the people of Texas approving it. So again, I think that's an important thing if we're going to ask you know, our citizens to entrust TxDOT with more money, let's use it as efficiently as we can. And I know they're looking at ways of doing that. They've been doing that over the last several years and will continue to go down that path. But I don't, Commissioner, I don't know if you want to talk about the process that you guys are going through right now to figure out how to allocate this. We're looking at using some sort of formula very similar to what we're doing right now uh, of going back through the MPOs. Where I saw Karen in here. Karen's going to be in the back. Karen runs the MPO here in Longview where the, the, each of the MPOs will receive some allocation from this. What that does is puts it back in the hands of local a decision body, which is where it should be, to figure out what are your needs within the MPO. <coughs> now, not everybody, not every uh, city, whether it's Henderson, uh, Jacksonville, we're not all in an MPO. So it's going to come back into the uh, state transportation plan. Uh, we're beginning to look at, at how are we defining, uh, we'll work with the MTP that Karen works with, and then our UTP, Unified Transportation Plan. We're projecting out 10 years. And believe me, we've had some fun discussions on this because what was projected 10 years ago, traffic patterns have changed. So it's a fluid document like a strategic plan on where we're going to spend the money. There are some on the commission that want to slow it down and say we need to study it more. Well, maybe that's good. But I can promise you with what people like Karen and her counterparts are doing, working through Dennis Cooley, Dennis Wigerhan. Dennis is our new Tyler District Engineer uh, to Randy Hoffman's place. Randy has uh, been promoted up uh, over all the rural ones. But what Dennis is doing, listening to uh, the, 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 the citizens, the judges, the elected officials, the process works. Anything we do to slow that down is going to hurt Texas and the benefits that, that we have. Uh, but looking at this distributing, uh, one legislator sent us a letter 
requesting basically almost earmarks. Here's where we want you to spend it. That's good, but let me also turn it around another way. I, I feel we still need some discretion because we get calls all the time to say, wow, we've got a new business coming in. We need a turn lane. Did you get my letter? Not a new building. <laughs> but we do, and we have to be able to respond to requests like that statewide because the very thing that we tout is our greatest benefit of bringing these businesses in, and I'm going to keep saying, and retention. We have to keep them. Because believe me, you probably hear it, I know Scott hears it, we have businesses that are being recruited from other states. They want to put a point of poke a finger in Texas' eye. We can't let that happen. Uh, but we have to continue to be stewards of, um, uh, and find ways for efficiencies. And, uh, as a senator, with y'all challenges with 100 million, and you know what Scott was talking about. Uh, two years ago, I challenged a staff, and Scott was the chief of staff. Can we save one in two or two in a few? Can we save one billion in two years or two billion in a few years? And I'm proud to say with some of the things that have been put in place, some of it's painful. <coughs> But we have identified well over two or three billion dollars in cumulative savings over a 10-year period. Some of it is reducing our fleet. Uh, I think the, the one I love to hear the most is uh, federal yellow. Uh, you know, we had a beautiful yellow uh, uh, paint uh, that we said that you know, caterpillar paint wasn't good enough. International Harvester, we had to go back and repaint yellow uh, to meet our standards, internal standards. Well, we cut that out saving five to $9,000 per vehicle. That's just one little thing. We've digitized, we're using iPads instead of using about a cost of $10,000 a month for printed materials for our meetings. We've uh, outsourced some of the IT. Uh, we've, we've gone through several other initiatives of where we're trying to find ways of using the private sector. And what I love about that, one of the, the foundation of this idea came from this gentleman sitting right here when he was Mayor Tyler put in the, the, the Tyler blueprint. And that went back and said, correct me if I'm wrong, if you can do it cheaper, faster, better, and still provide a, as good or better level of service, congratulations, we're gonna keep it in house. Otherwise, it's fair game, we're gonna look at outsourcing it. That's what led to this day, what Tyler is still doing. I think for in, in government, we're, uh, we have governance over like TxDOT, we have the ability to do the same thing. I think we can continue to look at outsourcing like maintenance. We've outsourced maintenance in certain areas uh, to make it far uh, less cheaper. So we have to be good stewards and demonstrate to the public that if the funds do come in, we're going to spend it wisely and it's going to go right where it's needed. And, and I'm, so I'm going to go back, back to Prop 1 because I'm going to be selfish here and continue to plug the proposition. We've, we've got to get this passed and we need y'all's help to do it. Uh, the senators mentioned it, the commissioners mentioned it. We have a clear funding gap and a crisis in the state of Texas. One of the things that, that really shocked me, and, and I'm sad to say it shocked me because I shouldn't have known this, but I was on a call a couple weeks ago and one of the TxDOT engineers was talking about how much construction the, the department's been doing over the last couple of years. And those numbers have been around seven or nine billion a year between the last two years when you look at kind of con new construction projects and rehabilitation projects across the state. Well, that figure is gonna drop to $4 billion in the next year, $3 billion a year after that, and, and below $3 billion the year after that. That's what we're looking at right now. So if we think that our transportation system needs work today, that's at funding levels because of the debt that we had issued at somewhere around seven to nine billion dollars over the last couple of years. But we still have congestion, we still have maintenance needs, we still have all those things. It's about to drop off. We're about to hit the, the wall that everybody's been, the cliff that everybody's been talking about over the last few years. And this proposition is, is a first step to get us back up to where we need to be. Add $1.7 billion to all those numbers and, and we're getting to a level where we can at least sustain Obviously, it's not where we need to be, but that's why this is so important, because we can't wait. We can't wait two more years. We can't wait for another session to maybe get some more funding for transportation. We've got to pass this, and when it passes in November, those funds will immediately be deposited to the Department of Transportation within a month or so that they can start allocating those funds. That's why it's so important that they're, they're looking at it now. How do we start planning to have those, those resources available to us? Because I know the legislature is going to expect TxDOT to get that money out the door and get it to good use. Otherwise, why would they need the money? So I, I think it's wise that the department is going down that road, but it's critical that we pass this proposition. 
And we need you guys, we need the business community engaged on this in a way that we haven't been engaged on transportation in the past. We have to rally all the voices across the state to talk about why transportation is so important. Why does it impact my bottom line? Why does it impact my employees, my, their families? We all have to be a part of that voice and, and be messengers to the legislature, not only through the constitutional amendment here in November, but also going into the next session. We're basically two months away from, from the start of early voting. We're 60 days out from when early voting begins today. And we need your help, we need your support, we need you to, to talk to folks in the community. Y'all are the leaders in this community, so we need you helping spread the word providing information about what the proposition does. We, we left fact sheets on everybody's chairs. Obviously we have a website that you can go to as well and get more information. And, and we'll do anything we can to help provide you materials to help spread that message. But it's just critical. Uh, the Senator needs reinforcement as he's, as he's talking to people about spending more money on transportation. And we have to be the ones to carry that message, providing that cover for the Senator, for Representative Patty, all the folks that are talking about how important infrastructure is so that next session we can do something about it. Scott, I noticed you guys are using social media to get the word out. Have you noticed much effect on that? We, we are using social media, and, and one of the things I'd also like to do is we're partnering with several other organizations across the state. So we haven't been as aggressive from our own standpoint with social media. There's another group, Texas Infrastructure Now, that's, that's also a partner in spreading the word on Proposition 1. They have a very aggressive social media campaign, and we're, we're plugging along with them. But if you go to any of the uh, social media uh, sites that we have, you can also get connected with them. Uh, I'd encourage you to do that, to follow, get on Facebook, on Twitter. We're continuing to promote the message, and it's a great way to get the word out. Uh, there's been some videos that have been created, uh, one just recently that, uh, that they put out there um, that's a great video. It's, it's a different take on kind of the political ads that we're used to seeing, which I think is great to help cut through some of the clutter that you always have in this type of year. One of the biggest challenges that we're going to have is we have a proposition on a general election ballot. And that's not something any of us are used to seeing. I, I don't know if you ever remember one. We can't find one where we've had to vote on a constitutional amendment. At the same time, we're voting for governor and U.S. representative and on down the list. And so that's a challenge, just making sure people are aware that it's even on the ballot. We're going we're gonna to be fighting that pretty hard to make sure voters know it's there. If you vote straight party, you still have to go and vote for the proposition. You can't just think your job is done. And so that's one of the things that we're really trying to get people to do as well. Scott, you mentioned something. This proposition, I want to say thank you to the Senator and the Representative. This was a bipartisan support. It had, it had bipartisan support to get it to where it is right now. And that, take, that took guts and it took a lot of leadership in both chambers uh, and with our statewide elected leadership. I know uh, Controller Combs has been talking about you know, the need for transportation as well. But this is something, it is a bipartisan issue. It's not a partisan issue, and I think this is something that we look, the things that we enjoy, just travel to another state, look at the roads, look at the business climate, read their headlines. They're losing businesses or it's closing down. You come to Texas, people are moving here, we love it, but we have to protect it and we cannot take it for granted. This is only one step. We know there's a lot of needs in the state, education, water, uh, immigration. There's a lot of different challenges. There's a lot of emotion uh, on a lot of these issues. All, all these other things set aside, transportation are going uh, to help you get to school, help a Friday night football with the football teams or bands traveling, parents traveling, business and commerce delivering the goods to our companies, uh, family and friends driving, and we want it to be in a safe, reliable uh, con uh, condition, and we have to protect what we have going forward. And so you're, this is an investment into each of your households, each of your businesses, and I do hope you do get, uh, get can, we're not supposed to lobby, but we can educate, but an educated uh, uh, vote would be great. <laughs> <laughs> On the handout, uh, I noticed at the top we have some percentages of population growth and the, the change. Over what period of years has that occurred? Tell us about those changes. Yeah, the, the graph there, that's that's one of the things that really jumped out at me when we started looking at this, and I think the commissioner mentioned some of those numbers, but that's over the last 40 years. So from, from the mid-70s to, to today um, are what's reflected in those numbers. 
uh, and a lot of that has been over the last decade. We've seen ex extraordinary growth as a state over the last decade. We, we've heard the stats kind of over and over again, over a thousand people a day moving here. Um, you know, one of the, one of the lines that, that I've heard several times that I just think is great is we have a thousand people moving here a day, they're bringing their cars, but they're not bringing roads with them. And that's why we're in the problem with that. Is we have this extraordinary growth, more vehicles on the road than ever before, 240% increase in vehicle use and a 19% increase in capacity use. I mean, it's, it's self-evident why the problem is what we have from a congestion standpoint and from a maintenance standpoint. Um, I'm, I'm blessed where I get to travel around the state quite a bit to talk about this issue and get to see firsthand the, the traffic that we experience on our roadways and some of the conditions of our roadways. I think TxDOT does a great job in keeping up with maintenance needs across the state, but they just don't have enough money, and so we're falling behind. And at the same time, safety is non-negotiable. Yeah, I'll say one thing, I remember uh, calling the senator, we're looking up updating our UTP, and one of the items of great importance to this area, we're looking at making adding some passing lanes uh, on 31 between Tyler and Kilgore. I know it's been a, a deadly route, but we're looking at improving that uh, long overdue. The safety is non-negotiable, and we need to make sure we make it back in the same roads. Yeah, and that's actually uh, something that we should be very concerned about. Texas as a state, and really this has been a national trend, up until about 2010, the, the number of fatalities on Texas roadways has, has actually had been decreasing over time. Uh, we've been a, done such a great job with some of the safety messages and campaigns that are out there, getting people to use their seat belts, work, working on um, getting drunk driving rates down. All of those things have been paying off. What's alarming is from 2010 to 2013, those numbers have gone back up. And that's something that is a really scary trend to see because we had done such a good job in lowering those numbers over time. Seeing that increase is, is pretty alarming as a state. And part of it, I think, is due to the fact that we haven't been able to keep up with the, the capacity needs that we have as a state. You have more vehicles on the same amount of roadway, you're gonna have more accidents taking place. And that's something that we need to address. Well, uh, Senator Eltop, I have a good question for you. Um, are there any earmarks, earmarks tucked into this proposition? No, there aren't. Good to hear. Uh, Jeff, have there been any studies that have attempted to quantify the cost in fuel and or lost man hours due to congestion? TTI, uh, at Texas A&M, has done an outstanding job of doing a variety of studies. And I think right now, you, know, you look at work uh, Te average Texan loses five to six thousand dollars a year because they're stuck in congestion. It doesn't take long. Go to go to Dallas, go to Fort Worth, and you look at some of the new capacity. Uh, you know, kind of coming back to the public-private partnerships. That's been the only way we've been able to move some projects forward for new toll roads and the P3 uh, public-private uh, public partnerships. So we're having to look at other alternatives to relieve congestion now. And you know, I'll, I come back to the uh, uh, time, money, lost savings. Construction signs are good. It may have a short-term pain, but the effect of the increased capacity and safety, they are going to be uh, far outweighed uh, the, the cost. But there is a lot of cost uh, that we spend time driving, and I think we're going to have to begin looking at new technologies uh, down the road. This is one thing we're challenged with. We're coming back to the legislature asking for some money to study new technology. Uh, many of our vehicles, whether you know, like cruise control, I was using cruise control over here, a car come in front of me, uh, moved in front of me. The sensors that we had that the vehicles have right now, and this is the Ford, slowed my car down automatically. So as we begin looking at potentially, and I'm going to stress potentially, using the vehicles that you have to where we can put in and maybe can read the paint that says there's a construction zone or something, or begin looking at bridges for the trucks, say your height is too high or you have construction coming on, or we have mowers on the side, using technology, Bluetooth technology, or things like that ahead of time, one, make it safer, but also if we had, a, hypothetically, a truck lane, let's take on 35 or 20, that was just vehicle uh, trucks, they could travel at 55 or 60 miles an hour go you know, faster and further without having to have all the weaving. They can use a element that the military uses right now. It's called convoy. The sensors will allow that truck to stay at a constant speed, much like a train, and move further and faster, quicker, and safer. So when we begin looking at reducing costs, we need to reverse that number back of lost hours, lost manpower, and lost real dollars to the pocketbooks of the people we all represent. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
The, the next question is, would be good for any of you, what happens if Proposition 1 fails? From, from my standpoint, it means that we're at, at least two or four years away from any additional funding for transportation. And you have the immediate issue of you're not going to get the $1.7 billion in this first year. That will continue to flow in. And I imagine that number will rise as we're seeing oil and gas production continue to increase, at least in the short term in the state. Um, but, but more importantly, when we go into the next legislative session, I find it impossible to ask the legislature to spend more money on to pass this so that we're not only providing that money for transportation, but we are sending that message to the legislature that this is important and we need to spend more money on transportation. Again, this is only a portion of the revenue, the funding, the, the investment that's needed in the state for transportation. But if we don't pass this, I don't think we're going to see anything. And, and I don't want to speak for the legislature, but, but as an outsider, I find it hard to even go to ask them to put more money into something when the voters of the state weren't willing to do so. I would just add, from textile's perspective, it's maintenance mode. No new, no new capacity. Any comments? Well, I think we're going to pass it. We need to pass it. And we've got to earn the voters to support. I mean, it's that simple. It sets us back quite a way if we don't pass it. I'd like to, uh, what was the margin of victories? Like almost 70%, 65 for the water proposition that we as Texans passed this last November. That's encouraging because transportation, much like water, the basic infrastructure that we need every day in our lives and businesses. So there's a, I'm encouraged by the, uh, the measure that that passed and asked them hopefully come over to the uh, road and the highway infrastructure. After Proposition 1, how do you plan to convince people to raise the tax on gas due to the econ economy crisis, increased costs for groceries, health care, et cetera? Uh, how do we find room for this tax increase? It's very hard to do, and I'm not, you know, I'm not very hopeful that we'll do it this session, to be honest with you. Uh, we've tried the last, I, I think since I've been in the Senate, eight years I've pitched raising the gas tax. The best, the best selling point I have is that we, the debt situation. You know, when I, every group I speak to, I ask them, would you rather of us raise the gas tax or double the state's debt? And they all say the same thing. It would have been prudent to raise the gas tax and index it to inflation and not have debt. The problem we have now is we do have a booming economy. Things are good. You know, we have a, we're going to have some surplus. And if this passes, a lot of people will say, all right, Delta, I've enough. You've you got your rainy day money coming. You know, you've got a surplus. Why do you need to raise taxes? And it goes back to you have to have a consistent long-term revenue stream to fix this problem. It's not going to fix itself. I'm afraid the way the elections went, you know, and I don't blame the newly elected members. You know, they're newly elected. They ran on no taxes, less government. A lot of them, you know, half the House will be new over the last two years. You know, half the Senate is going to be new over the last two sessions. Those new members are going to look at me and say, you're crazy. I mean, you know, we've got a surplus. I just got here. I'm not voting for a tax increase. And I, I understand that. So I think it's what Scott said, and I think you talked to the road contractors in this state. Their concern is if you look, if you do a chart on the lettings we can have over the next eight years, I'm telling you the, let, the highway contract lettings do this. And, you know, I hope we can convince somebody to find new revenue. I don't think it's going to happen this session. I think it's going to take a crisis with contract lettings before we get there. I think it's a shame, but I think it's even far bigger crisis if we don't pass properly. We have to pass Prop 1 to at least get a, some money flowing in the text time. Well, assuming that we pass Prop 1, who will design the plan for the net, whether it's a gas tax or a, a sales tax, or where is that going to come from and when? It'll probably be in a janitor's closet with the bottom of the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll probably be using a flashlight. So, I'd be the only one. You know, I, I think the legislature realizes that I mean, we really did. And you know, actually, last session, the House had, I think, they cobbled together, it was about $2 billion, wasn't it, Jeff or Scott, in fees and registration. The House tried last session, and at the end of the day, I, I think it was our governor who said, I'm not passing, I'm not going to sign anything that has any new revenue in it. And I think he pretty much said, it's dead on arrival. So if you're a House member, if I was a House member, I, which I wouldn't blame him, why would you vote for that if the governor's already said he's not going to pass it? 
So the House tried last session. Everybody tried. Um, so hopefully if we pass this, you know, maybe we can cobble together some additional. That's why I think what Scott said is exactly right. At least if we can pass this and the voters say we are concerned about transportation, maybe we, I've never thought we could fix this all in one session anyway. If we start with the rainy day money and Prop 1 money, maybe we can at least look at the registration fee, you know, and start the process there. It's not that difficult to get 500 million, a million a year off the registration fee. Maybe you start there and then we'll come back to your sessions and continue to add to it. But this problem is not going to go away. And if you look at what Speaker Strauss has outlined of, of how the House is going to start writing their budget, he's already addressing part of that issue where the State Highway Fund has, has about $1.3 billion over the two-year budget that go to things other than the Department of Transportation. Now, some of that's DPS, uh, some of it's the Attorney General's office, some of it goes to the Controller's <coughs> office. And all those things need to be funded, but his argument has been, and, and others have argued this before, let's make sure that the state highway, highway fund is only going to transportation. It takes that issue off the table, and that's $1.3 billion. So, you know, $650 million a year over the next two years, you add that to the $3.4 billion, billion, sorry, not million, the $3.4 billion that this will raise for the next budget cycle, and you're starting to make a pretty good dent into that, that hole that we have today. Um, as the senator said, this may take several sessions to get there, but at least those are a couple things that are starting that process. Um, I, I do believe that what Senator Nichols has talked about with the motor vehicle sales tax will be something that's discussed quite a bit this session. Um, you're already seeing a lot of that. I've, I've seen General Abbott talking about that in his uh, campaign speeches across the state. So there does seem to be some momentum on that concept. Um, but again, those are going to be debates that the legislature has this session. Uh, what's encouraging to me is that when you talk to members of the legislature, they're all talking about transportation being important, and they realize that this is only a part of the solution. So I do have confidence that if we can get this passed in November, it's something that they are going to seriously address this next session. Well, thank you so much for your, your work to take care of us and, and help us have great rooms. And uh, also wanted to ask, are there uh, other forms of infrastructure that need to be addressed that fall under this same very <coughs> area? Uh, absolutely. And TxDOT is not a highway department anymore. And I want to stress that we're not just a highway department. We are a department of transportation. Whether it's working with the airport here for FAA grants, and you know, I look at what the RMA can do. We're, we're supportive of the RMA. But we have a, we have in our LAR, our budget request to the legislature, we have some exception items in there. Uh, one is uh, uh, several million dollars to help dredge the intercoastal waterway with, that we have jurisdiction over. That is our marine highway. And if you look at a lot of uh, the barges that go back and forth along the intercoastal, one barge can move about the equivalent of 700 truck containers. That's a lot from air quality and moving. Right now, the average depth is about nine feet. We are authorized to come down to 12 feet uh, federally. And if we can dredge that out and keep it dredged, that will allow the barge traffic to be able to move stuff up and down and take it off the highways. Rail. Um, you know, I mean, we have an unfunded rail plan right now for rail relocation. You know, you think of even coming here, you stop at a, at a, at a red light uh, or stop at a train track, uh, which you should. Um, but we need to move some of those and, and make create quiet zones and whatever. We have a statewide rail plan that addresses, I, I like to say, the different constituencies of rail. Uh, one is freight, which is important. I'll come back and talk about that in a second, but at a higher speed. Uh, I attended last week the opening of the Orange Line from DART, going from uh, downtown out to DFW. Linda and the RMA has an interlocal agreement for long-range planning to look at expanding DART possibly down into East Texas somewhat. As we become, as people commute more and more to East Texas, how can we look at other modes of transportation? It can't all be on the roads. First and foremost, I'll come back to freight. We've got to get some of the containers and the truck traffic off of the roads. It's good, we need it, it's moving goods and services, but there's a safer way as to put it on the uh, on rail and continue to look at, at rail. We have, as Senator talked about, you know, debt or P3s. Right now, there's a moratorium on us going out and doing new public private CDAs, as we call them, construction development agreements. But we do not have that authority for rail. 
we have some bridges added capacity and uh, things like that we would like to be able to do that for rail for example uh, we own part of a railway out in west texas uh, Texas. it's being used at capacity right now to move sand back and forth up into the permian basin that we need that it would pay for itself we could attract private dollars in to pay for that rail there are other modes of transportation that we've got to begin looking at uh, and using some study to use a convoy system like a freight shuttle. So there's a lot of things that we can, we need to look at other alternatives. It's not just roads, uh, roads, roads.